Welcome to Church of the Harvest this morning. My name is Pastor Daniel. I'm glad that you're with me. I'm glad that you're joining with us uh, in church, virtual church. Uh, we're, uh, I believe, coming on 13 or 14 weeks now of being online only. And so thankful. Uh, I'm thankful for the ability to still uh, worship together, pray together, minister the Word of God together, despite the fact that we're uh, in our homes, we're in different locations. But, uh, you know, the church never shuts down. The Bible says, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. That includes a virus. That includes any works of the adversary. God builds his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So wouldn't you uh, just take a minute, join me in a, in a moment of prayer uh, before we get into the worship and then uh, I'll be back after with the, as we uh, finalize our series on the Holy Spirit this morning. But Heavenly Father, I come before you right now and I pray for every single person watching. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me as I minister your word. Father, I pray that every ear, every heart, every person would be able to receive from you today. Father, I pray that as we worship you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would fill the homes of every person watching. Father, that you would build your church, strengthen your church. Father, whatever the needs of your people are, that you would minister to their hearts right now in Jesus' name. If somebody needs a healing, a deliverance, an any area of their life. Father, your word says that we have this uh, assurance that whatsoever we ask in your name, it shall be done. So Father, we ask in faith, we believe you to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. In Jesus' mighty, wonderful, matchless name we pray. Amen. If you love Jesus, if you're happy to be with us online, Take a minute, uh, put amen in the comments, let us know where you're watching from, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to gather together soon, one day in the future. Uh, but until then, uh, I'm glad that you're joining with us this morning. Enjoy the worship, and I'll be back in just a few minutes to get into the Word of God together. Welcome to Church of the Harvest. We are so blessed and happy to be with you this morning. So please, at your home right now, praise the Lord with us this morning. Oh, 
Welcome back. I pray that you were blessed by that time of worship. Uh, before we get into the Word of God uh, and, and continue our part four on our sermon series on the Counselor, Comforter, the Holy Spirit, uh, the promise that Jesus gave to send us that Comforter, the one that comes and dwells on the inside of us. I hope you've been blessed over the last few weeks as we've been uh, studying on the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. We're going to finalize that, uh, that series today. Uh, but before, I just have a few quick announcements I want to uh, get through. And also, I want to share a word, uh, um, a verse of Scripture with you. Uh, if you have a Bible, go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. We're going to read that in just a minute. Uh, but I wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on in terms of uh, reopening. So for here in Quebec, the government still has not, as of, as of um, uh, when we're recording this, the government still has not given us any date or time uh, which we're able to or which we will be able to reopen. Uh, we are able to have more people in the sanctuary uh, in terms of filming, in terms of preparing the service, but in terms of actually having uh, uh, our congregation in place, we're still waiting on them to give us uh, a date and also uh, the requirements that will come along with that. With, this, with that being said, uh, and, and we, I've discussed with several of our leaders here at church, we've uh, made the decision uh, where we will continue for the month of July. So no matter what the government uh, says, we will continue streaming for the month of July. Uh, however, if the government does give us the, the right to gather together, uh, then we're going to open up the, the service uh, of the recording of the service, worship, preaching, and everything, to uh, a limited audience, which is pr what, what's going on in Ontario now. They're able to reopen, but only at 30% capacity. So uh, only a certain amount of people are able uh, to be in the, in the service at one time. So what we're planning, uh, and of course, everything will be based on what the government, you know, when they give us actual dates that we're able to, uh, to reopen, we will start by, for the month of July, uh, allowing people to attend those that want for the, the, the filming of the service, which will then be uh, uh, aired live on the Sunday morning. We're hoping, we're, I'm hoping, praying, believing that we would be able to do an official reopening for the first week of August. That's what I'm hoping, that's what I'm believing for. It's just my idea that might not be the case depending on what the government says, but the way things are opening up, the progression by which things are opening, I would, I would love if we would be able to have the first Sunday in August a uh, 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 coming back together, reopening of the church, maybe there might be restrictions and so on. So I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a heads up of our planning for the next month, uh, but all of that will will go week by week based on what the government uh, says, when we could reopen, how many people, and, and all of the restrictions uh, that will be part of that. So uh, keep us in prayer. Uh, pray for me. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our church. Pray for uh, the, the government, our leaders in, in Quebec and, and in Canada, uh, that we would be able to uh, to reopen in a way that's safe, in a way that people are, are able uh, to worship the Lord without having to feel any sense of fear, anxiety uh, from, from this. So, so let's just pray 
pray that God would uh, make a way and move in a supernatural way that we would be able to, to do so uh, in, a, in a right manner. Uh, with that being said, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is our time uh, where we take up our offering, tithe and offering. And I know because we're online, many of you are, are giving during the week. I know actually many of you give actually before Sunday now. So on uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, many people are donating online. Uh, so you've already, if, uh, I, most of you have already done so. Uh, those of you that, that have not, want to thank you in advance for your giving and sowing and your faithfulness. And I want to read a passage of scripture uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. The Apostle Paul here is encouraging the uh, Corinthian church, and he says this, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go, to, uh, to go ahead of time and prepare your generous gifts beforehand, which you have previously promised, that it might be ready uh, as a matter of generosity and not as grudging or a uh, grudging obligation. Verse 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart to give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always that you always having all sufficiency in all things might be able to have an abundance for every good work. So the Holy Spirit uh, speaking through the Apostle Paul is first of all encouraging the church to, to give, to be generous. So the part of our, um, as believers, we're, we're, not only do we profess Christ, not only do we acknowledge Jesus with our lips, with our mouth, with our hands, uh, with, with our, our lives, but also with our, with our substance, with our finances. And one of the promises here that is given uh, is that the Lord says this, but he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but he that sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let everyone give as he purposes in his heart to give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here's the promise, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you have... Uh, all having all sufficiency in all things might have an abundance for every good work. So God is not against abundance. He's not against blessing you. The only thing God is against is the love of money and greed. And one of the things that giving does, one of the things that it says to God, it says, Father, you could trust me with abundance because I don't love money. I'm not, uh, you're not living uh, to, for your only goal in life to accumulate wealth, but that God could trust you with abundance and that you will use that to help advance the kingdom of God and to help those that are in need. So let's uh, let's give, let's be generous, let's not be fearful, especially during this time. Stand in faith saying, God, I trust you with my offering. I trust you with my tithe. I know that you're the source of everything that I have and so I sow in faith and I give. And I know that uh, that promise that, that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9 is just as true for me today as it was for the Corinthian church when it was written. So I want to pray for all of you that are giving, that are sowing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every giver, every sower. Father, your word says uh, that he that sows sparingly reaps sparingly, but he that sows uh, generously or bountifully shall reap bountifully. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that your people would experience the fullness of your provision in every area of their life. Father, that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there would not be room enough to receive it. In Jesus' mighty, wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're with me this, this morning. Uh, online, be sure to uh, type amen, give us some feedback. It's always great to be able to communicate uh, and have that, uh, that opportunity to do so online, even though we're not able to see each other uh, physically in person. If you have a Bible, uh, which you should have, we just finished reading 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, but go with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, this will be the last and final installment on the series Comforter, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit. And this has been our, uh, our foundational verses, John chapter 14, verses 12. I'm, I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to stop at verse 17. Uh, and it says this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works because I go to, my, I go to be with my Father. You can ask for anything in my name. What is anything? Have you ever thought about that for a second? Jesus says you could ask 
anything in my name. Some people, you know, religion often tells you what you cannot receive from God, what God will not do. Uh, well, you know, you can't really believe for that, brother, because, you know, God, God won't answer that kind of prayer. No, no. Jesus says, you could ask for anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Father, so that the Son can be glorified in the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, Obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate who will never leave you. His, uh, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive Him because it's, it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him, but you know Him because He lives within you. Uh, he lives with you now and later will be in you. So we have this promise of the Holy Spirit. We have this promise that God gives us, that He will send the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the advocate that will come, dwell on, not just with us, but will dwell in us. And that, that power of the Holy Spirit will allow us to do what Jesus did. Jesus said, those that believe in me will do the same works that I have done and greater. One of the greatest lies of Satan, and I want to deal with that today in this message, what Satan would like to remove from the Bible or Christianity if he can. And I, I didn't really uh, ha have a, a, that's not a nice title. It's a long title. It's not a, a, clatch, a, a catchy title, but that's what I want to talk about today. What Satan would like to remove from the word of God or from Christianity if he could. And there are certain things that Satan would love to be able to take away from the Word of God. There are certain things that Satan would love to be able to take away from your life. He'd love to be able to take away your joy. He'd love to be able to take away your peace. He'd love to be able to take away the promises of God of, of to fill you with His Holy Spirit and power. So there are many things. He'd love to be able to remove the, the, the preaching of the cross, the power of Calvary, the power of the blood of Jesus. There are so many things that Satan would love to see removed, and we're going to deal with that today. But one, one thing that Jesus promised here, and this is such a powerful statement, that Jesus would make God in the flesh, the creator of the universe would say, he that believes in me will do the same works that I have done and greater. So I want to encourage you. I don't know, maybe you're feeling tired or discouraged. Maybe you're feeling like, you know, uh, life is, uh, everything that's going on with the, the riots and the protesting and, and uh, the, the pandemic that we're just going through and the financial situation that the world is in and, and all all of this put together, maybe it's got you feeling down or tired or weary, but I want to give you some, uh, some help today. Feel, I want to help you feel joyful. I want to help you feel encouraged today, knowing that you have a heavenly father that loves you so much that he sent his Holy Spirit to come and to dwell on the inside of you so that the same way that Jesus lived his life here on the earth, you have the ability to live that same way. If, if, if you think for a moment that Jesus went through life discouraged, if you think for a moment that Jesus went through life uh, uh, tired, depressed, discouraged, sick, you're wrong. Jesus Jesus was full of faith, full of power, full of authority. No matter what situation he found himself in, in the middle of a storm, in the boat, he was sleeping through the storm. Why? Because there's a peace that reigned in the life of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit of God, because he is God in the flesh. But that same ability that Jesus had to walk in peace and joy and to know that his Father was take care of every need that he ever had, you have the same ability, according to Jesus, to walk and to, and to stand on the promises of God and to experience life in the same way, the same peace, the same joy, the same provision that Jesus experienced in every area. Actually, the Bible says, just as he was in the world, so are we. Amen? Just as he was in the world, so are we. And so Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you, there's power in prayer. You know, a lot of preachers, there, there's entire denominations now that say, there's really no point in praying because God is sovereign and God will do everything God wants to do. He's already predetermined it. So whether you believe it or not, whether you have faith or not, whether you pray or not, none of that matters. That's, that's wrong. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. So when you as a child of God begin to seek God and pray and press in, you'll see God begin to move in your life like never before. And the other thing is to be patient. You know, often times we feel like if God doesn't answer prayer immediately after we prayed it, we feel like uh, we, we abandon, we abort 
uh, our prayer, we feel like it's, it's not going to be answered. But faith, not only does faith ask, but faith believes that you've already received when you ask, even though you might not experience it yet in the natural, faith is believing. Like Abraham believed the promises of God and stood, stood in faith, knowing that God would say and God would accomplish what He said He would do. That's faith. Faith is not that you try it. Faith is not that, well, I'll, I'll see if this thing works. Faith is believing that He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. Faith is knowing in whom you have believed. Faith is trusting that if God said it, He'll accomplish it in Jesus' name. Amen? And so we talked about the first week, we, we dealt with the subject of uh, the, the, the five or six statements here that Jesus said, you'll do the same works that I have done. Ask anything in my name, I will do it. He promised us the Holy Spirit, that he'll lead us into all truth, that he will never lead us or forsake us. We dealt with all of that week one. Week two, we dealt with the description that Jesus gave uh, to, the, uh, to the Holy Spirit, which is the word uh, in the Greek. The word uh, parakletos, which, which literally means one called alongside to help. Or in a, another definition in the Strong's was one who pleads another cause before a judge or before as a defense counselor. So one who pleads your case before a judge. And, and the third definition was the Holy Spirit destined to take the place of Christ after his ascension to the Father to lead and to direct the church. So the Holy Spirit comes, God, Jesus says, I, I will give you another, I'll give you my spirit. In other words, even though I'm going to heaven, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. You'll have my Holy Spirit that will dwell in you, that will be able to guide you into all truth, that will allow you to pray and, and, and receive answers to your prayers, that will allow you to be in communion with me. I will be in you, you will be in me, I'll be in the Father. So there's that, that whole teaching here, how Jesus is talking about the intimacy that we will have with God because of the, of the indwelling, infilling power of the Holy Spirit. And so the week, last week, I, I kind of inserted a special message in relating to all of the situation that's been going on uh, in our world with uh, all of the uh, racism, all of the hatred uh, that we've seen in the news systematically, uh, people because of the color of their skin uh, being killed. And then that turned into violence and rioting and buildings burning and, 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 and police being shot and people being killed because of that. And so that's where you see Satan is, is, is behind this. Not only is he behind racism, but he's also uh, fueling the anger of division and the fuel of fire. So on both ends of the, the spectrum, you have Satan kind of playing, playing both sides of the fiddle, pu pulling the strings of a lot of people. That's why the only real lasting solution for racism is when the Holy Spirit comes into an individual and changes their heart from the inside. Because racism at the, at the core is demonic. And the only way to overthrow Satan is, the, is by the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling on the inside of an individual and, and delivering them from a spirit, a demonic spirit of racism. And so now, and racism in every form, not just uh, 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 against the black community, which we, uh, I dealt with that uh, specifically last week. I also talked about how the Jewish community was, uh, was, um, uh, was uh, had dealt with uh, racism at a, at, a, at a level that most other nationalities have never uh, experienced before. Uh, and so the, the, the black community, the Jewish community uh, are kind of a extreme examples of racism, but there are also other forms of racism in every way. Uh, sometimes we treat Arab people differently because of their language or because of their faith. Or, uh, and, and so there's a, there's a racism that, 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 uh, that we have to, as Christians, be the light of the world and not allow a spirit of racism or a spirit where we uh, where we treat people differently because of their nationality or because of the color of their skin. So we dealt with that last uh, last uh, week. If you didn't listen to the message, I want to encourage you to go online and listen to it. And then also, I want to thank all of the I, I've received uh, text messages and emails and phone calls from people from our church. Um, uh, telling me uh, how much they appreciated uh, uh, me saying what I said last week in regards to um, in regards to the racism, systematic and systemic racism that's been uh, lasting for many many years uh, in the United States, and and not not so much maybe as much here in Canada, uh, but it's it's on a different level maybe. 
But racism is still present in every country all over the world. And so we've dealt with that. But as I, I was speaking with some of our members of our church, people that I love, um, one, one in particular, uh, a couple, Yemi and Bukun, who are part of our church leadership, uh, and uh, Yemi uh, sent me some information that he, well, f- uh, that he dealt with or things that he lived as a, as a black man coming to the first to the United States and then to Canada, things that he lived. And I won't, I won't go into details about that, but it, it's, it's, it's sad to see how people could still try and deny the fact that, that people of a different color are treated differently. They are. There is a systemic racism and we need to stand up and be a voice uh, against it. But he, he sent me and Yemi sent me some, uh, some information about different things that had happened. Uh, but also recently, just yesterday, he sent me a link um, to um, a Bible that was produced for slaves. So th- this was a Bible that they would give to slaves and they would redact or remove certain parts of, of our Bible that we, we have access to so that those that were, uh, that were in slavery wouldn't try to revolt or rebel. So there are certain things, that, and when I, was, uh, I watched the video that he sent me about that, uh, it, was, it was shocking to see, first of all, they removed or they redacted uh, the story in the book of Exodus where Moses will, uh, goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. So they remove that whole, that whole uh, uh, story where Moses uh, uh, pleads for the, um, or not pleads, but basically declares uh, by the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, for, that, the, for the people of Israel who were enslaved in Egypt to be free. And so that whole section was removed so that they wouldn't think that they could ask for freedom or believe God for freedom. Uh, they removed the entire book of Jeremiah and, and, and specifically the Bible uh, in the book of Jeremiah Jeremiah says this in verse 22, verse 13, Woe unto him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. So they removed the entire book of Jeremiah. They removed the entire book of Galatians, uh, which is a, a passage of scripture that we read last week, which says this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ and there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free there is neither male nor female you are all one in Christ Jesus and if you are if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to his promise so they removed entire books of the Bible entire chapters have been redacted and removed from the Bible so that people that were enslaved didn't feel or couldn't use the Word of God or the Bible to feel like they had rights or that they could uh, um, demand freedom. And, I, and as, as I was uh, thinking about that this week, I, I, I had a whole different kind of message planned, but then uh, Yemi sent me that link, and it began, the Holy Spirit began to stir something in my heart, and thinking about slavery, and thinking about how uh, the African American community had been treated in such a, in such a, a, a demonic way, to, to the point where you see how Satan works, where he would even use the manipulation of the Word of God to try and get people, to keep people bound, and as I was as I was thinking about that, as I was uh, meditating on that this week, I felt like the Holy Spirit say, Satan is still trying to do the same exact thing to the body of Christ today. There are things in the Bible, there are things in the Word of God that even though you and I have the full uh, chapter and verse, you don't have a, 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 a book of Exodus that has been redacted. You don't have a Bible that's missing the book of Jeremiah, or the book of Galatians and other, uh, other verses of Scripture. Even though we have the full, full Bible uh, from Genesis to Revelation, the enemy is still trying to do the exact same thing. He's trying to get people to live out a Christian life where they will pick and choose certain aspects of the Word of God that they like, that they feel is good for them, and to reject other aspects of God's Word. And so he's, he still has that same, that demonic spirit of trying to remove certain teachings or certain principles or certain promises from the Word of God. And so I, I I began thinking about this. If Satan 
What are some of the things that the devil would love to have removed from the word of God? And, and I mentioned a few at the beginning of the message, but first of all, I believe Satan is trying to get the, the preaching of the power of the cross removed from our pulpits, removed from our lips, removed from our thinking or from our theology. We have this, this whole movement in, in the church, especially in this, this, high, this new ideology that it's more important to preach um, uh, messages that would help people in their day to day than to preach the cross or to preach the blood. It's more important to give people uh, tips on how to have a better marriage or tips on how to have a successful career or tips on how to have a positive mental attitude or all that kind of stuff. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible teaches on marriage. The Bible teaches on how to, how to be successful. The Bible teaches about how to think right and how to uh, have a take authority over negative thinking. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is the, the, the enemy is trying to get us to focus on certain things while he wants us to remove other aspects of the Word of God that are really the, the, the primary uh, um, message of what God wants to convey. The primary life-changing power of the gospel is not in a, a humanistic type of a message. It's in the fact that God came in the flesh, died on a rugged beam, a rugged Roman cross. He died a bloody death so that you and I could be delivered. He healed, set free, and saved. And so the Bible, actually Paul says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so if, if there's one thing I believe Satan would love to have removed from, from Christianity, from churches, from pulpits, from, from the mouths of preachers, would be the preaching of the power of the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus. I also believe if Satan had his, his, uh, his way of, uh, uh, if, if, if he had his, um, his choice, he would also have every teaching that talks about sin or talks about living a holy life before God or having the fear of God, he would have that removed as well. Live, live however you want to live. Act however you want to act. Do whatever you want to do. God's loving. God's full of grace. And have this idea or this mindset in the body of Christ where there's no more need to sacrifice. There's no more need to resist sin. There's no more need to live holy. Like, like as though you could do whatever you want to do and God will be pleased with you just because you're so amazing and we're so amazing. This lie of, of, of the adversary trying to get us to cut out certain aspects of the word of God. I'm sure if he would have his way, the enemy would love to have hell redacted and removed from the word of God. I'm sure he would love to have uh, eternal judgment and having to stand before God one day and give an account. The Bible says for every deed, every action, every word that, that's proceeded. Actually, the Bible says every gesture or word that's proceeded out of our mouth will have to give an account one day before God for it. I'm sure he would love to have that removed and taken away out of, out of the church and out of, our, out of our teaching and out of our preaching and out of the Word of God. But you know, one of the reasons why God calls preachers and pastors and evangelists and teachers is not to say what people want us to say. He's, you know, as, as a preacher, there, there'll be certain messages that I'll preach that some people will be amen pastor i believe i love you i'm you know and then other people will say well you know that i don't i don't believe that or that's too condemning or that's not loving or that's not grace enough or love enough i've had people leave our church because well you know you don't preach grace to the full extent of what grace how grace should be preached so the minute you talk about sin the minute you talk about holiness the minute you talk about judgment ah no 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 pastor that's not for me. And so people have this, this mindset where they want to pick and choose out of God's word rather than taking the full counsel of what God said. And uh, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says this, And he himself gave some apostles and some prophets and others evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, uh, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of of deceitful plotting, but, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So here we have a powerful uh, passage that explains why 
pastors and evangelists and teachers what we're called to do. The Bible says that, first of all, we are appointed by Christ. So Jesus, after he ascended, not only does he send the Holy Spirit, but one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit appoints leadership in the church. And that leadership, he tells what that leadership is supposed to do. One of the first things he says is they are called to edify the body of Christ. So true godly leadership, one of the things that I'm called to do, and one of the things that I take very, uh, very seriously, is to edify the body of Christ. So we're not called only to correct and only uh, to be hard. And oh, you know, there was a time in the church where it was the opposite. The only messages you heard was the fire, uh, the fire brimstone, judgment of God, fear of God. So there was a, a time where pastors and preachers only taught in, in those lines, or for the most part. And then there came a kind of a pendulum switch where we went from fire, brimstone, the judgment of God, to beginning, you know, grace and love, and Jesus loves you, and there's nothing you could ever do to disappoint God uh, or, to, or to grieve the Holy Spirit. But so God is calling us as preachers, pastors, teachers, evangelists to edify the body. So if, you're, if you listen to a godly man or a woman of God preach, one of the things that should happen is you should feel edified in your spirit. You should feel encouraged. You should feel strengthened. You should feel like the Holy Spirit is, ra is raising you up. You should feel like I could do what God's called me to do because one of the main uh, purposes of the fivefold ministry office gifts is to inspire and edify the body of Christ so that you would grow up and be strong in Him. The, the second thing that, that God says uh, that the that fivefold ministry uh, pastors, teachers, apostles, evangelists, prophets are called to do is not only to edify, but that, that we might come into the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. So the second thing is so that there's, a, there's certain things that God wants us to know that He'll reveal through the preaching of the Word, that then we could come into unity, where instead of being divided, where everybody has their own mindset, or own ideologies, where we could come together under the banner of faith, under the unity of the Word of God, and pursuing God in faith, with, with, with the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, to the full measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. So think about it. God is building a church, and He puts people in the church so that we could, as pastors and teachers and preachers, edify the body so that we could then grow into the fullness of who Christ is. Why? Because we're the body of Christ. I'm not individually the body of Christ. We are corporately the body of Christ. Every single individual fitted and joined together to form the body of Christ. And so, the, so, uh, so till we get to the unity of the faith. And so as a preacher, I'm not just called to, to edify, but I'm also called to preach truth. The Bible says one of the last things that, uh, that Paul writes there is that we are called to preach the truth in love. And so there's sometimes where, where things, things are said which you might not always agree with or people might not, not always, but I'm not a politician and I'm not called to, to, to say what everybody agrees with so that somebody could vote me in or, or whatever. The, the preachers, pastors, teachers, evangelists are called to speak the word of God in truth and in love. And sometimes it hurts. Sometimes truth hurts if, if it's because it's convicting your heart. So you're living away or you're going in a direction Direction and God wants to stop you. God wants to warn you. God wants to turn you around. And He uses the foolishness of preaching to do that. He uses imperfect men and women to preach a perfect gospel so that He could reach people, not only worldly people or lost people, but He also wants to edify those that are already born again. So if you're born again, the purpose of preaching now for you, it's not to get you out of the world into the kingdom of God. It's to get you to do and to be what God's calling you to be. It's to be the person, the man or woman God wants you to be. It's to find your place in the body of Christ where God could use you mightily, where you could pray and lay hands on the sick, where you could speak words of encouragement, other people. And so the body of Christ is never supposed to be just about individual preachers, but it's supposed to be the uh, uh, fivefold ministry gifts to train and to equip those that are part of the church for the working of the ministry. And so in Luke chapter 10, one of the things that I believe that Satan would love 
We, I mentioned a few things before, but one of the things I believe Satan would love to get re redacted or removed from the church, from the body of Christ, is any teaching or mentioning of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the, the indwelling, infilling power of the Holy Spirit in your life is what, number one, changes you. Because just making a decision intellectually to accept Jesus doesn't change you. You know, it's like saying, uh, my father used to say this way, just uh, spending a lot of time in a McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac or spending a lot of time in a garage doesn't turn you into a car or spending a lot of time in a church building doesn't make you a believer. You are what you are if you open up your heart to receive God and to receive the Holy Spirit. God will never force himself on you. He'll never impose himself on you. And so one of the things that Satan would love for us to stop talking about is how people could get the, 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that number one, changes your life, but number two, which empowers you to live out this Christian life in accordance to, the, to the, what God wants for you. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it in the flesh. You can't just try to do it from an intellectual level. You must have an encounter with the Holy Spirit that, that completely revolutionizes and completely transforms your life. That's the only way to really live this thing out. And so when you have preachers and churches and ministries that try, and, and, it, and it's not, you know, some do it uh, with, with good intentions. They, they, they think they're trying to protect their congregations or trying to protect people from uh, certain abuses that have happened over the years with the moving of the Holy Spirit. But the minute we begin removing teaching on the blood, removing the preaching of the cross, removing preaching on, on, on sin or removing preaching on, on, uh, on, on the fear of God or removing preaching on hell or removing what the word of God says in, in terms of being filled with the Holy Spirit, what we have is a dry, dead church living out a, um, a, a, a th intellectual theology without the inward filling of the, of the Holy Spirit. And so one of the reasons why Jesus told the disciples, before you go anywhere, before you do anything, wait in Jerusalem until you're filled with power from on high. And then when you're filled with power from on high and the Holy Spirit is in you, then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so look what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he says to the disciples, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. I want to read that verse 19 again. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Think about that for a second. Jesus makes a promise that because of the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing the enemy could do could have power over you because you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Nothing. So you say, well, you know, I feel discouraged today or I feel tired or I feel, and, and, and it's okay to go through a moment. I, I've been through it myself, even going through all this pandemic. There's been days where I just feel weighed down and tired. There's moments where you feel tired. But here's the thing. You need, when that happens, what you need to do, what I need to do, is uh, meditate on the Word of God, thank God for His promises, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Because the Holy Spirit is always present to help you and to strengthen you and to edify you and to build you up. So if you feel like you're, you're weary or you're tired or you don't know what to do, think about Jesus' promise. He that believes in me will do the same works that I have done and greater. Think of the promises of, of Jesus when He said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto to you. So no matter what your desire or your dreams are, and sometimes one, one of the things the enemy tries to get people to do is he makes you feel like you'll never be a success in life. You'll never get out of that situation. You'll never, you'll never see that mountain uh, of sickness or that mountain of debt or that mountain of depression. You'll never see it removed out of your life. But I want to, I want to remind you of Jesus' teaching. When Jesus taught his disciples about faith, he said to them, have faith in God for verily, verily I say unto you, if you speak unto this mountain and tell it to be removed and tell it to ca be cast out into the sea and, and you shall not doubt in your heart, but you will believe those things 
things that you say it, you shall have whatsoever you say it. And then the, la- the, the other verse right after that, he says, and when you stand praying, believe that you have received it and you shall have it. You shall see it come to pass. So I want to, I want to encourage you, no matter what you're facing today, if you're discouraged, if you're tired, if you feel like maybe the Lord has abandoned you, maybe where, where's God in all this? How come God's not moving in my situation? I want to be a source of encouragement to your heart today. Why don't you stand in faith like Abraham stood, like Gideon stood, like Joshua stood, like Daniel stood, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like they stood in faith believing that my God is able. He, is, he promised it and He is able to fulfill the promise that He said He would fill. If you believe that, if you've ever experienced the power of God in your life, take a minute, write amen, let me know how God has moved in your life or in your heart over the years. We serve an amazing Father. And I want to end with this this story. So if Satan is not able to remove or redact uh, certain things from our vocabulary or from our belief or from our uh, from our churches or from our teaching then the, the one of the things that Satan will often resort to is he will try and get the church or people to call what's evil good and what's good evil he will he'll try and get the world to speak about certain things that are really evil and demonic as being good and try and get other uh, uh, the world to to say things that are of God, things that are things that God has done as 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 demonic, and things that are demonic as good. So one of his tactics is has been that, and it's not that the enemy started to do that recently in our generation. Look at what he does here in Matthew chapter twelve, verse twenty two. The Bible says this: Then one was brought to Jesus who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and Jesus healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Verse 23, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this, could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself, could, could, um, every kingdom divided against itself, is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand if satan casts out satan he he is divided against himself how will his kingdom stand so just drop down to verse 31 and then jesus makes this statement therefore i say unto you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men but the blasphemy against the the spirit will not be forgiven men anyone who speaks against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So think about this, this story for a minute. Jesus, through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit that's working in him, delivers a man who's, who's, uh, who's both blind and mute, who's demon-possessed. That man is delivered by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees, seeing that the people are... Are, are noticing the ministry of Jesus. And if you read the Bible, you'll notice that Jesus was very hard on the Pharisees because he would often call out the hypocrisy uh, that they were living where they would say one thing and do another. Or they would put um, laws on people that people couldn't fulfill and then they themselves would look like they were more spiritual and more, uh, more honorable than other people. And so Jesus would call them out. So the Pharisees are now accusing Jesus this and Satan is behind this so he's he's trying to get the people to attribute as evil what the Holy Spirit is doing so he's saying oh no no the, Jesus is casting out a demon because he himself is filled with demons. So the first thing that Jesus does is he addresses the the fallacy of their of their accusation and he says well if I was if I was possessed with demons Satan can't and, and will not overthrow Satan because if he did so, he would be overthrowing his own kingdom. And, and no kingdom divided against itself could ever stand. No family divided against, or no, you know, so he explains why that, that, that accusation doesn't even make logical sense. But here's where you, I want you to see how Satan operates. One of the things that the enemy would love to do is get us to be able to remove certain things from our church or certain things from our theology. And one of those things that Satan hates is the preaching of the Holy Spirit. It's acknowledging the power of the Holy Spirit. It's acknowledging how the Holy Spirit could 
come in and transform and change the life of a person and then empower you to live for God, empower you to be the light of the world, empower you not just to be, uh, I go to church once a week, I listen to a sermon once a week, but to be a living, breathing, moving child of God, operating and advancing the kingdom of God wherever you go, whether you're in a grocery store, whether you're on a bus, whether you're at a family gathering, wherever you go, the Holy Spirit is there to convict the hearts of people, to move in the hearts of people. And so you have to understand that there is no weapon formed against you that shall prosper. The, Jesus said, I've given you authority to trample and to tread on the heads of every snake and every scorpion and every working or power of the adversary. So Satan hates the teaching on the Holy Spirit and he hates it because it's only the Holy Spirit that could allow people to, to experience the freedom that comes from God. This man was delivered by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit and Satan wants to to accuse what God is doing or take what is good and he wants people to call it evil. And so there are many, you know, there's, there's many divisions, many conflicts sometimes in the body of Christ today over the moving of the Holy Spirit and over the working of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you, if you're a, if you're a child of God, if you're a believer, and I had to do this as a pastor, I had to, I had to tell preachers that I loved and cared about, but that, that would attack the moving or the working of the Holy Spirit. And I would say, I get your points that some churches and some people have have claimed certain things that oh well, this is the holy spirit therefore you can't question it and that's wrong and they've done certain things that they've exaggerated and they made they made church look like a just a, a mess and just no order and no structure and no vision and no direction and no word. And I get that. But here's the thing. Don't ever fall into a category where you push away the moving of the Holy Spirit, where you push away the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you push away. I, I, I want everything that God has for me. I long for everything that, and everything that God wants to do in your life, He'll do through the indwelling, infilling power of the Holy Spirit. And so the, Satan would love for us to remove that teaching. Satan would love for our Bibles not to include the promises that Jesus said, that he that believes on me will do the same works that I have done and greater. And Satan would love to have that verse that we just read in, in, Luke, in Luke 10, 18 and 19. I saw Satan fall from, from heaven like lightning. I've given you power, authority to tread on the heads of every snake and scorpion. Satan would love to have that removed from, from our Bibles, from our thoughts, from our teaching. But I want to tell you something. Satan can't stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. No demon, no devil, no, no attack of the adversary could ever stop the advancing of the kingdom of God. And you, if you're a child of God, if you're born again, you have power and authority in your heart, in your life, in your mind, over every working of the adversary. So don't don't ever, don't be discouraged. Don't feel like there's, you have no hope or you have no, uh, no choice. You can't see a mountain in your life moved. You have the power uh, by, because of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you to see mountains moved, to see things change, to see storms being calmed. Why? Because he that's in you is greater than he, that, than he that's in the world. So I don't know if this touched you in any way, but I want to just close in a moment. I want to pray. And I want to pray for every person watching. I just, I just keep, uh, I keep felt feeling in my heart that during this week. And I guess even myself, I was talking to a, a, a good friend of mine, actually just a, a few minutes before coming to uh, a preach about how I, I feel like there's this weight, there's a heaviness uh, that's, that's, that's hovering on a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. People are saying, I'm tired, I'm weary, I feel like, I feel weak. I don't know if it's the fact that the pandemic is being, you know, going on so long and, and there's just kind of a tiredness or a weariness or, or a, 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 um, like kind of like the enemy is trying to make us feel like there's no power, there's no strength. And if that's you, if you feel that way, if you feel, if you're struggling with something, I want to pray in just a moment. And I want to believe that God will give you you total freedom, total victory. But before I want to read one last uh, verse of scripture, one last passage. It's, it's in First John, chapter five, verses fourteen and fifteen. And this is a passage of scripture that I read almost almost every day. It's one of those two verses that I, I declare uh, uh, before I, I spend time with the Lord. First John chapter five, verse fourteen says this. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Let me read it again one more time. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. 
that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. So I want to pray. We're going we're gonna to believe God's Word. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, the enemy's a liar. He's the father of lies. The Holy Spirit is able to touch your heart and life right now where you are. So if you just close your eyes, bow your heads with me, just take a minute in the presence of the Lord, and we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We magnify your name. Father, I, I, we're so grateful. We're so thankful for everything that you've done in our lives, for moving in our hearts, for moving and, and, and giving your life so that we could have eternal life. Dying for us so that we could have a relationship with you. Giving, showing, and demonstrating how much you loved us by giving your life for us. And so, Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you sent your Holy Spirit so that we wouldn't have to remain as orphans, but that we would have your, your Spirit dwelling on the inside of us. And so, Father, I pray right now for every person watching, every person connected with us. Lord, I pray that they would sense and feel your love, your peace, your joy, that your Holy Spirit would move in a supernatural way in their homes, that, Father, every weapon formed against them, every lie of the enemy, every discouraging thought, every thought that God, you, you, you know, that, that you're not going to move or that you're not going to accomplish it, every lie that Satan has been bombarding in the minds of your people, Father, I come against it right now in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I speak life, I speak joy. I speak faith in their hearts, Father, that we as a church would believe that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you never change, that you never move, that you never vacillate between positions, but that, Father, you were a healer 2,000 years ago, and you're still a healer today. You delivered those that were oppressed 2,000 years ago, and you're able to deliver those that are oppressed today. You're able to do signs, wonders, and miracles 2,000 years ago, and you're the same today. Father, we believe, we trust, we honor you, we thank you, and we know that you're doing a mighty work in the hearts and in the lives of, of each and every one of us. And so, Father, I agree with our church, every person that's part of this church, and those that are, those that are joining us that are, might not be part of this church, but that are part of your church, your body, all over the world. Father, I stand in agreement with them right now. And I ask that you would move in a supernatural way. Break every chain. Destroy everything that the enemy is trying to do to, to keep them bound or keep them discouraged. And Father, I pray today, today, that they would be filled with joy. Filled with joy. Filled with peace like never before. In Jesus' mighty, wonderful, matchless name, I pray. And if you believe that, if you love God, take a minute, type amen. Let me know. I'm glad and I'm always happy to be able to minister and share the Word of God with you. I hope you, you receive something in your spirit today. I hope God built you up today. Keep, keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord. Don't, you know, don't, now's not the time to kind of uh, push the things of the Lord on the side. Now's the time to stir up your spirit and, 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 and uh, cultivate the flame and the fire of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Not to, to lose faith, but to actually grow in faith. Not to, to turn away, but to, to seek God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And so before we close the service, we want to just take a few more minutes. We're going to sing one last worship song together. So stay with us as we just worship the Lord for one more, few more moments together. And then I'll see you next Sunday morning at 1115. God bless you. I love you. See you next week.
Still stand up.